Hello, everyone. Oop, I almost hit the end broadcast button. <laughs> so how are you all? Can you see and hear me? Yay. I see Abby is here and Stacy and Samantha and Amanda, and Liz. All right, Brooke, Sunshine, great. Awesome, so my son's practicing piano. Hopefully the sound won't disturb the sound here too much. I can hear it, but. All right, so yes, I see that Stacy's already uh, added a question, which I think that everyone who's ever tried to declutter a bunch of stuff has felt for sure. So that's definitely something we're gonna be addressing. Uh, Stacy, are you, you are here, right? Um, <laughs> sad face, you can't hear the piano. That's lucky you. <laughs> I wish I couldn't. <laughs> Yay. Okay. So can you give examples of some of the things that you aren't sure you might need? Like it's useful. You might need, you might need. I know, I'm not sure if maybe some specific examples, and I know other people too relate to that. So what are some of the things that you have the most difficulty trying to figure out if you should declutter and get rid of them or not? I think um, finding home for things and decluttering is one of the sticky topics because it is so important and it is so hard. And there's a lot of stuff on decluttering out there. And a lot of times the perspective is one of minimalism in such a way as if, you know, minimal, having as little as possible is our goal. Or being minimalist is you know, virtuous. That is the goal. We should get rid of as much as humanly possible. And that is just not um, necessarily true. What we want is wise stewardship of our resources. And that's why it's such a hard decision when you have the different things and you have to make a decision. Should I get rid of this because of the space that I have? Or should I keep it because I have it and I might need it? You know, it's kind of a frugal gene. And frugality is good. Um, so um, there's crickets in the air that you no one wants to give any examples of things that they're having a difficult time trying to decide if they should declutter or not. <laughs> or maybe people are just listening um, and that's fine too. Um, yes, if it was garbage, it would be easy, exactly. Uh, but the thing is, especially as you read stuff on decluttering, you need to keep in mind that part of the reason why um, there's difficulty in applying it is because you are probably coming at it from a different worldview as the person who's giving the advice. And minimalism or having you know low impact on the earth or whatever, is not this it's not the same life goal right so our life goal is stewardship of what god has given us and so we have to find that balance in wisdom between stewarding the things the resources that we have the stuff um which is the the thing itself and also it represents either the history behind it um, or the money that went into it at one point, and then also stewardship of the space that we have. So there's this, these two different things that we're having to steward and trying to figure out which one wins almost, you know? Um, yes, having clear flat surfaces frees my brains. Freeze my brain. Yeah, not freeze, freezes. The clutter freezes up, right? So um, no breathing space. Yes, all the books and all the books are always all over, especially if you have young children. <laughs> I feel like I have all these bookcases. 
but the books are so often not on the bookshelves. But at least they do have the home, right? So even if the books aren't on the shelf, they do have a space to go where they're supposed to be. So if we just practice that daily EHAP, at least things like the books have a space to go to. The problem are all the things that don't have a space to go. So they just end up moving. Things end up being set down somewhere because there is no home home for them to go to or the person who's picking it up and setting it down doesn't know where that home is. Um, no, Abby has a good uh, rule of thumb. She starts with the question that if she didn't already own it, how much would she spend to purchase it again? And if it's under $20, I donate. <laughs> so that's that's a rule of thumb. Um, and, you know, the thing is, you know, we have, you know, multiple children. So we have the hand-me-down things. We have things that maybe some children have outgrown, whether that's clothes or shoes or books or toys. But it's not just them. And that's another thing. A lot of the minimalist declutter advice, they have no kids, two kids or something. And they don't have this span of stuff. And you don't want to get rid of the dollhouse or the baby toys or whatever, when you have someone else, even if no one's using it right now, you should have someone else coming up. The bumbo, the all the all the stuff that goes around goes with small children. <laughs> like the younger they are, the more stuff that there is, it almost seems like, until you get into Legos. But at least Legos are small. Um, yeah. And, and then on the other side too, it is true that having clear horizontal spaces helps our clarity of mind. So we want to give things intentional homes. And so, you know, that can be as simple as if there are papers and they need to be close at hand, they need a place to live that's not just spread all over the counter. You know, get some horizontal surf, some um, vertical storage, you know, baskets that have the papers sit upright or something where it just covers it. It's a place for it to go. And even if all the papers that are on the counter, whether all the mails, some are bills, some are invitations or paperwork or whatever, all of it can go actually into one container. Sometimes perfectionism stops us from giving things homes just simple homes, minimalist homes, maybe even because we think, okay, if I'm going to give the paper a home, it has to be, you know, sorted and filed and labeled and all this stuff. But it's like, what, what's one step better than what you have now? It's a sad girl. What? She really wants to ride in the road and she can't if I'm not with her. <laughs> Mommy? Yes. I didn't even get to ride in the road. You didn't even get to ride in the road? Yeah. Oh. Oh, maybe now you can hear the piano. The door's open. Um, you're not going to ride in the road either until I come out. And then we're going to go to Costco. Let's talk about stuff. Costco. <laughs> um, so instead of thinking that you have to have some kind of perfect system where all the papers have to be filed and labeled like just give them one place like one basket or a magazine holder you know those are tall they take up little space but hold a lot of paper and as long as you know where to find it when you need it that's organized organized does not mean perfectly labeled and sorted and just so organized means you know where to put the thing it has a home and you know where to look for it if you need it so don't it doesn't have to be a full-blown complicated system or you know super specific this big process to set up it can be just finding one place and saying okay all incoming papers are going to go into this divider this magazine folder and it's going to be here. 
And then as long as you say, okay, where was that paper? Well, if it was a paper, I would have put it in there. You know, you can sort through a handful of paper pretty quickly. So it would, if it would take you more time to set up a system and to file a paper than to just sift through the handful of papers that are in there, then you're overcomplicating your organization system. Yeah, you can have that. Magazines, things you look at again. Um, so, and then, yeah, the, the decision fatigue, do I keep, do I donate, where? Um, and you know, the thing about recipes is that they're all online and you can find way more recipes than you would ever need, you know, in 30 seconds. So it, you know, Abby's idea for, you know, it could, would I buy this again right now? Or how much would it cost to replace this if I ended up needing it again? That's one rule of thumb. Another rule of thumb is how much time will this save me if I keep it versus how much time will this save me if I get rid of it? And so in the case of a magazine, are if you need a recipe, are you going to go flipping through the magazines or are you going to Google? And which one should you do? <laughs> um, you could even you know, make a Pinterest board, keep an Evernote, and that would be another option. Evernote, it, you know, doesn't take up that much more space. You're, there's a recipe in a magazine. You say, I might want that someday. And I might not remember to Google it. I'm saying, well, if I wasn't going to remember to Google it, do I really need it? Or do I really want it? But I said, no, I really want to keep this idea. Snap a picture with your phone save it into Evernote, you can search for it there because as long as you know where to look for it, if you need it, then it's organized. So what good are all those magazine, all the information in the magazines doing you? If the magazines are there as amusement to browse through, then that's a good reason to keep them. If you're thinking of the magazines as a place for information that you might need later, it's not a great place because it's half ads. It's, you know, not very useful form for keeping information. Um, probably the exact same information is available online, or you could snap a picture and file it into Evernote. Uh, someday is the black hole. Yes. Um, so yes, some kind of inbox, something, as long as you know where the things are, that's the goal. Not that things are all labeled and all picture perfect. Like you could put your system into a magazine, but that it's labeled or that it's not labeled, you know where it is. That's a home. As long as you know where to look, if you need it, that is giving something a home. Mm-hmm. Can I go in the bath and do this? Uh, it's not bath time right now. Maybe this afternoon. Okay. okay. No, we aren't, we're not going to talk about that right now. Can you go close that door for me? You can stay here or not, but I need that door closed. Okay. <laughs> so, um, okay. So we've got papers, magazines, hand-me-downs, all this stuff. But the truth is you, you have space as well as stuff. And so we have to find some way for the two to meld, to blend. And um, if you don't have the space for it, you can't give it a home and you need the, the space that you have determines what you can keep. So someone with a big home, a lot of storage space, can keep more things than someone with a small house. And so there is no one right way to do it. There's no one right amount of stuff. Uh, there is your space and, you know, it has to fit. And part of that frustration is when we have more stuff than space. So space really is the limiting factor. 
And um, that can be difficult if you, you know, you're not in the home that you want to be in for forever and you say, but we want to get a bigger house. Well, you know, partly it, the stuff will come back. It's not going to be hard to fill the space once you have more space. But um, yes, the space that we have is the space that we have and it's better to be grateful for it and to steward it wisely than to wish it were different. <laughs> it is a truth universally acknowledged where the space, there, if there is space, I will fill it up. That is correct. Yes, learning to live in the space I have, not the space I hope to have. Exactly right. So, you know, I've had to do that with books I was like, okay, well, these are the shelves that I have. Am I going to get another bookshelf or am I going to either rotate the books out? We do a little bit of that with our school books. We have a three-year, <laughs> I know, um, we have a three-year history rotation. So I have a bucket for the books, the picture books that go and the biographies that go with the history cycle we're not in so that those books can rotate out so we don't have to have a space for all the books. And then we do that with toys too. We don't have space to keep all the toys out. And then that helps cut down on the amount, the scale of the mess in the, a single day. But we can rotate toys out. But the amount that we can rotate out and in depends on this amount of storage space. Right now, I, can, I, am, I have a moratorium on Christmas or seasonal decorations because the space is full. There is no room to put anything more. Um, yeah, so you're not only stewarding the, the stuff itself, you're also stewarding the space. And the space is a lot harder to change than the stuff. Like if you have need to make the two fit, it's much easier to change the stuff amount than to change the space amount. Um, uh, books I rotate besides the his no, those are the only I have, you know, the big totes. So I have three big totes, one per cycle in the three year cycle. So one, I, you know, I have two so that the books rotate two big totes are put away and one is out on the bookshelves. Other than that, I just keep um, my husband keeps building me bookshelves. <laughs> I think I have one shelf still there. So, um, and I've, I've already been looking. I have a dining room wall. I think, you know, really this whole wall could just be a big built-in, really narrow. It's a book, you know, what's the average size of a book? <laughs> I, I think I have, I have more bookshelf space. Decorate with books. That's, that's my plan. But we do rotate toys. We do rotate clothes because we all have small closets uh, and I, I pare down clothes a lot. It's really tempting when the hand-me-down bags go around. We get have a lot of opportunity to get hand-me-downs, which is awesome, but it's also super tempting to take more than we have the space for. So that's part of the criteria. It's like, okay, my daughter has one drawer for shirts and she can't have more shirts than fit in that drawer. <laughs> like that's our limit. It's pretty clear. It's not me saying, you know, is this too many? Is it not too many? It's like your drawer can't close. You can only have so many things as still allows you to close your drawer without smashing and pushing. And usually it just stays open. And then that means fewer even jeans because they take up more space. So it's like, all right, you have a shirt drawer. I have a shirt drawer. I have so shirts that are a problem for me so much as sweaters. I have a sweater drawer for cardigans and it's over full. Um, and in fact, I, I uh, got rid of some scarves because I really don't wear them that much. You know, like the, I used to wear them more. I've been wearing them less. And so I pared down my, you know, like the, the, the colorful scarves 
so that I could have a few more sweaters. I was like, okay, this is my drawer space. It's limited. So I'm going to only pick the ones that I actually wear. Um, even if the others are nice. And like I said, I have, we have a circle of friends that passes along clothes, including mom clothes. So that is a way to help it feel better to get rid of things. So I'm not like throwing it away or even donating it. I'm saying, okay, I'm putting it back in the mom circulation bin, but then I have to be careful about what I take from that mom circulation. Oh, you know, love my cardigans. Um, yeah. <laughs> Closets are tricky things. So, um, yeah, and books that some, a lot of books that you need are just available online. So that's a way to save space for sure. Um, yeah, and the clothes are getting to be a bigger problem. With babies, there's the, they change size every three years four months and you have to have a lot of clothes because they'll soil them and they go through a lot of clothes. Turns out that as they get older, the clothes are just so big. They can only have a few. And so we have to do laundry pretty often because their clothes just, I mean, I have two sons that are in men's sizes. So they're just lots of fabric. <laughs> Yeah, what do they really need? It, it affects laundry. That's, that's why it's hard. That's why finding things homes and putting things away is hard because it's not just decluttering. It's a decision, making a decision whether to keep, keep it or get rid of it would be bad enough. But one thing affects another and it's this whole ripple thing where if you declutter the clothes, that means your laundry routine has to change. Um, if your laundry routine is once a week laundry, you have to have enough clothes to make that work. You have to have enough clothes to last for a whole week. So that all of these things affect something else that we often don't even realize until we start getting rid of things or we start really thinking it through or we start looking for excuses because we can always also find those um, yes, that's true. It's what's your scarcity or abundance mentality. Um, yeah. Yes. And one way that we have, um, added more storage space, our kids are in bunk beds, so it doesn't really work for that. But for our bed, um, I got little, their bed stilts basically from Walmart. So they put the bed up just, I don't know, like four or five inches up higher. The frame just sits on top of these little stools, kind of. And now I can fit laundry baskets underneath. So I can fit six laundry baskets underneath my bed, um, which is super helpful. So right, like the snow suits are in one. Um, my pajamas are in, so it's kind of like another drawer. So, you know, finding unconventional ways to fit in more storage is one side. There are ways to find more space um, and steward that space in a way that lets you maximize useful storage, where otherwise some of these things would just be out or, you know, getting in the way or cluttering up some other bin, um, you know, with the size of everyone's coat now, not even everyone's winter coat fits in what was our winter bin, much less a snowsuit for everyone. And last year there was crazy snow, so we all needed them. And then it's like, well, that's more stuff, but I have to find the space for it. And so that means getting, getting rid of some things or rearranging the space or finding some other kind of bin. Um, it's, it's work, it is. And so it's okay if it feels like it's taking a lot of mental energy. Um, it's not because something is wrong with you. It's because you're being a steward and these are hard decisions and it takes creativity. So think of it as a creative challenge, making your stuff and your space mesh. You can find creative storage solutions and you can 
decide what you really need to keep or what you don't really need to keep. Um, and this always reminds me of a friend of mine who gave each of her kids one bin for their special things, their special drawings or things they wanted to keep. And when the bin was full, she would tell them, now it's time for hard choices. So whenever the stuff doesn't fit the space, I was like, now it's time for hard choices. And uh, it is hard and it is continual too. So especially with a growing family, the stuff is always coming in and the needs are always changing. So it is not a once and done sort of thing, which a lot of the decluttering minimalist approaches, you know, set, set it forth as this project that once you're done, your life will be amazing and wonderful and you'll never need to do it again. I'm sorry to break it to you, but this is going to be continual <laughs> until maybe you are all alone and it's only your things and you have this figured out. Then maybe you won't have to declutter anymore. But while you're managing a household, it's just part of managing the household. And there will always be times of things coming in and times of things going out and times to rearrange and figure out how to make the space fit the needs now. It's, it's part of managing a household. And that's what we're called to do. And you can do it creatively and we should do it cheerfully. So um, that is my little organization secret or some of that might be organizational bad news. <laughs> but the good news is this is the job we're called to do. And so God gives us what we need to do it. And even little things like decluttering are not um, something we need to do on our own, but we can ask God for good attitudes while we do it and for wisdom and making the right choices for our family's needs. So, um, so thank you all for joining me and I will be checking out where my four-year-old went off to, <laughs> what she's doing now. So thank you all.